Welcome back, everybody, to this uh, really terrific conference, which is, uh, I mean, making me feel good about things after a long time when you're not feeling good about most things, right? So it's, it's really been excellent. And we have another all-woman panel, which I'm very delighted about, uh, which is going to be uh, even more international than before. We've got, uh, we're going to get um, discussions on India, Ghana, and then also very local, Massachusetts, and local, so it's going to be, I think, extremely interesting. So Seema uh, is going to begin. Seema has been working for three decades with women farmers in uh, different parts of rural India, but mainly in Maharashtra, the western state, and also with the widows of the farmers who committed suicide, who then also are farmers, obviously, but often not recognized as such. Linda is going to be talking about Ghana and a lot of the issues that come up, again, for women farmers in Ghana. Jess has been involved with different fishing. fishing, exactly, that's right, and environmental consequences of some of those fishing as well, right? And the rights of the fisher people and so on. So, um, and we have Liana who's been working in UMass, teaching in UMass, and with the um, Workers' Rights Consortium. So it's Really excellent. I'm really looking forward to this. And Seema, please go ahead. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, good afternoon. And uh, firstly, uh, I'm really going to apologize, but uh, it's really no fault of mine. But I've lost my voice in the last uh, two weeks that I've been touring around US and uh, trying to amplify voices of women farmers without a voice. But uh, so please bear with me. And I do hope that uh, I will be able to say what I want to say through my slides and uh, Q&A. So uh, I'm actually going to talk about uh, really the invisible uh, women farmers who are not recognized as farmers. Uh, so really talking about how uh, we as a network uh, in India uh, have been making an effort to visibilize uh, you know, various categories of uh, women who are involved in uh, different activities in agriculture. So whether it is as cultivators, as livestock workers, as fisher workers, uh, but also as agriculture farm laborers. laborers. So, uh, yeah. So, just to put uh, things a little more in perspective, uh, who really are, uh, you know, the women farmers and what is, what really does the data look like? And uh, this is all uh, official data. And unfortunately, we still have the old 2011 census because uh, the government refuses to conduct uh, a new. Uh, census until uh, the elections are done uh, next year. So what does the old uh, data show us? Uh, that more than 65% uh, women, uh, and these are female workers uh, who are engaged in agriculture. So that's a, a huge uh, percentage of women who are participating in agriculture. And if you look at the breakup of all the cultivators, and cultivators are not necessarily landowners, but those who are actually operating land, uh, you see 32% are women. And of all the agriculture labor, uh, close to 40% are women. So uh, there's a huge presence of women in agriculture. Uh, what we also rely on is really the more recent sample survey data, uh, which is done annually. And that is actually showing an increase in uh, the participation of women in agriculture. So we have 76% uh, of our female workers who are actively engaged in agriculture. But if you look at uh, next uh, infographic, which actually tells us about uh, ownership of resources. So really the paradox and the contradictions uh, that the official data is trying to bring out is how there's a large presence of women in agriculture but if you look at uh, operational holdings, unfortunately, India still does not have data 
on gender disaggregated data on land ownership in the public domain. So what we really go by is uh, what is done every five years and which is known as the agriculture census, which shows that only uh, roughly about 14% of the women are operational holders. So effectively, you know, women who probably own land, land or have land titles and they're operating only about 11% of the agricultural area. So you see the paradox of high engagement and participation in agriculture, but no access to resources and land as the central means of production. Uh, recent time use uh, data that also has been done because of a lot of pressure from feminist economists and feminist movement is also clearly showing that there has been an increase in unpaid care work that women are engaged in. So you have high participation in agriculture, declining employment, paid employment in agriculture for women, and lack of resources, lack of ownership uh, over resources. So that's really the paradox that we are uh, dealing with. And that's also a compelling reason why we are arguing for women as farmers, recognition of women as farmers. If you look at access to credit, and I'm talking about institutional credit, not the credit that goes, uh, you know, uh, non-institutional through money lenders or through other financers, which is completely unaccounted for and which goes at really very high interest rates. But if you look at the institutional credit, which is through banks, uh, our government, the recent government, uh, which has been in power for the last uh, two terms, uh, introduced something which was, you know, uh, purportedly very empowering for women with, uh, you know, uh, zero uh, balance accounts. So you don't really have to put in any money to have uh, an account in a bank. So we have a large number, really an increasing number of women who actually hold accounts uh, in banks. But uh, unfortunately, what we are seeing is that while women have accounts in these banks, and they're also depositing money through the informal credit system, which is, you know, in India, what is called as the self-help group movement. Uh, so women's deposits into banks are also increasing. But if you look at the credit that they receive for any income generating activities, or more specifically in agriculture, the credit that they receive is really just 27% of the amounts that they have deposited in banks. And if compared to men, uh, you see that it is 52% uh, for men. But despite the, you know, the credit movement and the small microfinance movement uh, that women are actually uh, involved in, so it's, it's always a story about how uh, women's credit needs start small, but unfortunately remain small as well. With all of the credit that is bundled together through microfinance, does not go beyond 8%. So that's really the kind of access that we are talking uh, about for women farmers. So how are we really defining uh, women farmers? And uh, we go back to, uh, you know, fortunately we had uh, in 2007 a National Commission for Women for Farmers, which was headed by Professor Swaminathan, who recently passed away. And... Uh, the 2007 definition, in a way, uh, expands uh, the definition of farmers to include uh, everyone who's, inclu who's engaged in economic and livelihood activities of growing crops, producing other uh, agricultural commodities, and includes among various activities, cultivators, laborers, fisher folk, forest workers, etc. So that really is a tool in our hand because it is here that we can really start talking about women as farmers. Because otherwise, the entire architecture of agricultural programs, or even water irrigation programs, is around ownership and access to land. And that is where, you know, the dismal picture that we saw in terms of just 13.8% of the women as operational holders already excludes women from any of the entitlements that come by way of agricultural programs. So clearly, uh, the way programs are designed, 
the way policies are designed in agriculture, irrigation, environment, uh, fisheries, is to exclude women. And when I say women, it is not a homogenous category. It is divided across caste, ethnic groups, class. So a large number of diverse groups of you know, socioeconomic categories of women is what we are talking about. So tribals, the scheduled caste, who are, you know, Dalits, known as Dalits, with very little access to resource, so ex except for their labor, so their bodies are their only uh, resource. So this is the group or the collectives that we are talking about and uh, who, are we, who we are working with. Uh, just to give you a little about the forum, so this is uh, a forum for women farmers' rights. It's called Mahila Kisan Adhikar Manch. Mahila is women and Kisan is farmer. And uh, we work across uh, the country. We do have a presence across most of the states of the country. But uh, we are very active in about 9 to 10 uh, states where we've made a visible presence in terms of both uh, with our advocacy with the governments, but also very actively engaging with uh, political movements, with farmer movements, with unions that are working with uh, farm workers, with migrant workers in the agriculture sector. So I come from uh, the state of Maharashtra. Uh, this is a Western Indian state, and uh, supposedly a state which is rapidly urbanizing with a very high uh, GDP and a per capita income, so uh, not uh, you know warranting any kind of support in terms of uh, particularly the rural, uh, but uh, with a state like Maharashtra, where uh, agriculture is contributing something like 14 to 15 percent to the economy, but has more than 50 percent uh, that is still dependent on agriculture for its livelihood. So that's the urban rapidly urbanizing state that I'm coming from, and that is really, uh, you know, facing issues of agrarian distress, and more specifically, uh, farmer suicides that probably some of you may have heard of. So uh, what I would be really talking about today is uh, two categories of workers, and uh, these are women from farmer suicide households who are unfortunately only recognized as widows, and not farmers and workers in their own rights. So it's really about visibilizing and uh, speaking about them as workers and the rights that come to them as workers and farmers. And the second group that we're working and very actively engaged with uh, are the sugarcane workers uh, who are migrant workers who migrate for half of the year to different parts of the state, but also to different uh, states in the country to harvest uh, sugarcane, and sugarcane is a very significant crop in the state of Maharashtra, particularly because the entire political economy of the state revolves around sugarcane. So, you know, the kind of crops that are promoted include sugarcane and cotton, and both the reasons of agrarian distress that we are really witnessing in uh, the state of Maharashtra. So, if you look at <clears throat> uh, farmer suicides in India in general, and you have uh, uh, P. Sainath, I think, who's coming uh, next week to talk here and has done some phenomenal work on actually visibilizing the question of farmer suicides in India. And today, with uh, more recent data, uh, we have something like about 400,000 farmer suicides in the country, and the state of Maharashtra accounts for 20% of these suicides. So something close to 85,000 suicides uh, are recorded in the state of Maharashtra, uh, which offers, unfortunately, the lowest compensation to families that, uh, you know, uh, where a suicide is committed uh, in comparison with other states which have a higher compensation. And a very, uh, you know, ridiculous kind of an answer was given to us by a minister when we were engaging in conversation with him and uh, sort of uh, doing advocacy and saying, that, you know, this is a state with high numbers of suicides, but your compensation amounts haven't really increased. And he ridiculed us by saying, oh, you know, increasing compensation amounts would actually lead to more farmer suicides. So why are you arguing for that? I mean, that is the level of, you know, understanding and the kind of 
policy engagement that uh, senior level ministers have. So in Maharashtra, we are talking about uh, close to 100,000 suicides and the women who are actually left behind because very little is said about the women who are left behind. Unfortunately, uh, policymakers engage with them only to talk about relief, just, you know, what could be the rehabilitation and relief, but not really to rebuild their lives, uh, which should be around agriculture and the farm work that they do. So unfortunately, many of them are rendered as wage laborers, often in low paid work or underpaid or unpaid work, facing social stigma, the huge financial liability that they carry because there's a suicide, which is because of indebtedness and, you know, it's a spiral of uh, debts, actually. So it's not just one single event, but it's the agrarian distress as a result of the kind of policies and the kind of political economy uh, context that we witness in India. So there's social stigma, women are ostracized, they're not allowed to participate, uh, there's a financial uh, liability, there's mental health issues, uh, there are distress marriages. So really early marriages are seen in uh, households where uh, we see uh, suicides. And uh, of course, women are rendered. So the other context is about uh, droughts and where uh, sugarcane uh, workers are migrating. Again, this is a system which is based on advance. So it is really like bonded labor or modern slavery because advances are given to uh, couples who form the unit of work, really, and uh, there is a suppression of wages. Uh, these are also laborers who come from uh, areas where there's a high percentage of landlessness and drought uh, conditions. But the working conditions you can see, and there's a lot that I've been hearing uh, from yesterday, which also resonates in a way, but also talks about differences. Uh, the poor living conditions, but more uh, specifically, I would like to talk about issues of women who, who really uh, are less talked about, you know, questions of reproductive health, a high number of hysterectomies uh, or removal of uteruses that were seen among sugarcane worker, women sugarcane workers uh, has been reported. And, uh, you know, we've had reports of wombless villages. So there are villages that just migrate for a period of six months and uh, villages where uh, hysterectomies have been reported uh, at a very high scale. So we have financial sexual harassment uh, that is very, very uh, prevalent among these migrant workers. So what are really the political implications of these uh, developments? We have increased unpaid, underpaid, and lowly paid work. Uh, women are largely bearing the burden of care work. Uh, there is an increasing marketization and commodification of everyday lives because of the kind of agrarian paradigm, which is really pushing farmers into suicides. So whether it is just monocropping of cotton, sugarcane, or increasingly soya bean. So the entire uh, cropping systems and the agrarian model is also uh, increasingly leading to commercialization and marketization of everyday uh, lives. Uh, so really, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, the actions uh, that we as Makam, as a network, uh, have been talking about uh, need to be understood in this broader uh, political economy context, where uh, while we are talking about, about the larger mainstream agrarian models and the agrarian distress, uh, what we are very mindful of is also about patriarchy, caste, uh, you know, the social structures of inequality that also have to be addressed alongside. And that is why we thought uh, that unless we really start talking about uh, issues that are very specific to women who come from across socioeconomic categories, really need to be brought to the forefront if we also want to uh, extend our solidarities to larger movements that are talking about farmer issues and migrant uh, workers' issues. So these are uh, some of the broader issues that Makam has been talking about. There have been victories that have been uh, we've uh, at the uh, state uh, level in Maharashtra, we have got the government to bring out a policy which is specifically addressed uh, to the women farmers from farmer suicide households. So the demands that we had in terms of prioritization uh, for women as farmers 
to give a very strong compensation package to women farmers. Uh, much of that has at least on paper been brought out, but of course enforcement uh, is uh, an issue. And here we are, you know, through local actions, through policy advocacy, uh, through a lot of training and worker education, we have managed to get women on the ground doing advocacy from the local to the state and to the national level. And we have very strong collectives in rural Maharashtra where we are talking about uh, sugarcane workers. This was a large conference of more than a thousand women sugarcane cutters for the first time really coming, rallying, and saying that we want recognition as workers. And there was a registration campaign that I would just like to show pictures uh, before I close. So this was a, a registration campaign, you know, just the fact that women should be recognized as workers, as sugarcane workers. So the government actually brought out a policy that said, okay, we'll register you as workers, but they were registered as dependents and not as independent workers. They fought it out and they said, no, we are independent and we need separate identity cards. And that's the campaign that really uh, has taken up uh, like a storm. But I just will probably use one extra minute to say that Makam is committed, uh, yes, to voice recognition and entitlements of women as workers, but we are also looking at alternate pathways. And that's where I think uh, challenging the mainstream agrarian paradigm is something that women farmers are talking about. Migrant women sugarcane workers are saying no to migration. They want local economies to be developed. They want local employment to be generated and are also fighting for alternate ways. And agroecology is one of the ways that we have large numbers of women here who've signed up for working on their own farms or farms that have been leased out uh, where they're saying no to monocropping, no to chemical intensive farming and moving towards a natural farming movement uh, that is really taking off uh, with uh, women. The conversations, of course, grew around COVID when women said, we have land but no food to eat. We were growing cotton. We can't eat cotton. We can't eat soya bean. So we really need to think about alternate ways. And that's where we've really uh, moved towards uh, a very colorful farming, which is mixed farming, but which gives you food, nutrition, and also uh, you know, the cash that is required. So these are our women who, as women farmers, face a different set of issues and constraints that really need to be tabled and uh, voiced. I'm just going to leave you with pictures of uh, what really a diverse group of women come together and do to agriculture, do to challenge the mainstream agrarian paradigm. So I had a video, but I, I'm, I am running out of time. So thank you very much for bearing with me for my voice, but also for the extra time. Thank you. That was also, I think, very inspiring, and in some of these pictures also. So Linda, please, go ahead. I forgot to mention that Linda was our colleague. I still think of her as our, still our colleague, but she's currently at Mount Holyoke College. <laughs> so, I'll always be your colleague yes, at yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so I decided, oh, thank you. I decided to focus my presentation on um, the organizing strategies of informal workers uh, for personal reasons as well as uh, for structural reasons. Um, I grew up in a family in which everybody was connected to the informal economy in some way. Um, my grandmother, my mother, um, myself at some point. Um, and so I, you know, this sort of led me when I was, you know, started my career as an academic researcher, it made sense for me to start working on the informal um, economy, on the urban inform informal economy. But the informal economy um, is not just personal to me, it's also significant in the African continent. Um, according to the ILO, the National Labor Organization, Informal employment in most sub-Saharan African countries makes up between 80 to 95 percent of total employment. So it's a pretty significant sector of employment. And most of most workers um, in the informal economy are not covered by national labor legislation. They're not um, subject to social protection. They have few entitlements or no entitlements to employment benefits, such as advance notice of dismissal, 
paid sick leave, severance pay, and so on. Um, and until fairly recently, there's been very little attention to their organizing structures, um, strategies of, of informal workers um, in Africa, and mainly because I think they were seen um, as incapable of collective mobilization. Um, and when they do mobilize collectively, the organizations for a long time were viewed as having limited political uh, relevance. There's been starting to see some shift in that. Um, and so these um, publications that have come out in the last 10 years um, have tried to look at different ways in which informal workers are beginning to organize collectively. Um, and I will just, men they mentioned, they, they highlight several developments. I just want to focus on three of them because I think, um, well, that's what, that's what my presentation is going to be focused on. The first is the predominance of collective organizations of informal workers that look different from the way we typically think of worker organizations in the formal economy. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. <coughs> Um, the second development is efforts by these informal workers' organizations to cross the divide between formal and informal ways of organizing by collaborating um, and engaging with more traditional labor unions. And the third development is the scaling up of the organizing activity of these organizations beyond the local, so by um, connecting with transnational and international organizations they're trying to expand their reach to the national as well as the global um, and regional levels. Um, and so what I want to do today is to illustrate some of these developments by focusing on the organizing strategies of two very different groups of informal workers in Ghana. The first group um, are casual wage employees who work for a multinational agro-industrial corporation headquartered in Belgium. And um, for this part of the presentation, I will be drawing heavily on research by a colleague um, at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Um, the second group are self-employed women who work as market porters in the capital, Accra, um, who are the subject of my own research um, you know, for long-standing research. Um, and some may wonder, well, are the self-employed really workers? And I think, I take the approach that I think James Hines uh, put forward some time back, that people who derive the bulk of their income from selling their labor, whether they're selling their labor on a wage market or indirectly by selling a product or a service, um, and who are dependent on other people for the realization of, those, of that income should be considered um, workers. So the first case is the case of casual employees at the Ghana Oil Palm Development Corporation, um, GOPDC for short. This is the largest firm in the oil palm industry in Ghana. Um, in addition to oil palm cultivation, it's involved in extracting and refining palm oil for local consumption as well as for export, um, and it supplies oil palm, palm oil to some of the biggest um, you know, cosmetic global industries worldwide. Um, it's a big firm. It owns over half of the 41,000 hectares of land under oil palm cultivation in Ghana, and its milling capacity is a third of the country's total milling capacity. Prior to the 1990s, it was operated as a state-owned corporation, um, and the bulk of the production was undertaken by workers who worked directly for the firm. Um, in 1995, the government of Ghana sold the corporation to the SEAT group, which is an agro-industrial group headquartered in Belgium with subsidiaries in several um, African countries. The workers were laid off as part of that privatization process, and they were hired back as cash flow employees. The firm now relies heavily on informal employment arrangements. Over, at the time um, of Dr. Bichum's research in 2013, over 70% of the firm's almost 3,000 direct employees were employed on short-term contracts between three to six months. Um, almost all of them work in the agricultural services department, so they're carrying out activities, as you can see, such as planting, pruning, spraying, harvesting, transporting the palm fruit to the mill. A very small share of the casual workers work in the mill, about 5%, and another 1% work in the corporate um, finance and workshop departments. They're paid a daily piece rate per tree, per palm tree, um, and each worker is expected to cover a minimum of 82 trees per day. 
And what this translated into was a, a monthly wage of 144 CDs at the time, roughly about $70. Sorry, this was a monthly wage, less than the official daily monthly wage of 162 CDs. So they were paying less than the official minimum wage. The workers were not provided with protective clothing, and the firms would charge them for the cutlasses that they used to do their work. Um, what was interesting was that almost all the contract workers had been working for the firm for more than five years. So they were being rehired. They would work for three, a three-month contract, go home for a month, and then get rehired, come back. And this is very, and some of them had been working there for as long as the firm had been in existence, 20 plus years. This is a practice that is prohibited by Ghana's labor laws. Um, so anyway, in 20, 10, the workers, many of whom had been unionized when the firm was owned by the state, began to make efforts to organize. And part of this was um, initially they, you know, the, the motivation to organize was because they had supported the firm's permanent workers in asking for salary raises, in anticipation that those salary raises might then trickle down to them. And when it became clear that the permanent workers did get the salary raises, but it didn't trickle down, um, they took the initiative to start organizing and negotiating. So the first thing they did was to draft a document outlining um, new conditions of services, negotiating with management. And initially, they were successful. They, they were able to get a 100% increase in their daily wage, and the firm promised or management promised access to medical and ambulance services, access to the company school, and um, to start making contributions to the National Social Security um, um, Scheme. When the company failed to follow through on this, the workers um, went on a two-day protest. So what, how did management respond? It was a classic response. They gave, offered 150 of the 2,700 casual employees permanent positions and then created a new system of categorizing the workers as skilled, unskilled, and semi-skilled with changes in their, in their pay structure um, in, in, you know, along those lines. And of course, the casual workers saw this as a way um, to, to break their solidarity. So they decided to form a union, recognizing that support from a national union could be helpful in their negotiations with management. So they um, brought in two different unions, the Ghana Agri General Agricultural Workers Union, which is the union that organizes majority of our agricultural workers, um, and the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, which organizes workers in other sectors. The workers felt that the ICU was more responsive to their needs, was more interested in organizing um, casual employees and representing them. And so they chose to go with them. The problem was that the permanent workers were represented by the Agricultural Workers Union. And so management decided that this would be, um, Ghana's labor laws don't actually require elections um, for people to, to, to determine which union represents the majority of workers. And so the, the management decided to sort of slow down the process of verifying and recognizing the union and insisting that there was no need for workers to be represented by two different unions. Um, not long after, the workers protested, went on another protest, not a strike, but you know, a week-long protest, and the company dismissed all 24 leaders um, of, the, of, the, of the movement. The dismissed workers filed for um, unfair dismissal, and the case is still making its way through the courts very, very slowly. So where do things stand? Currently, casual workers at this firm continue to be hired on three- to six-month contracts, they now earn at least the official minimum wage, and the ICU continues to support them in their legal battle by covering their legal fees, their legal, legal costs, and so on. Meanwhile, the firm or the company continues to insist that it's, it, it's willing to negotiate with only the one union, the Agricultural Workers Union, which the workers see as having been co-opted by management and plagued by leadership battles. The union, the Ghana Agricultural Workers Union itself, is not in, doesn't seem interested in organizing casual workers. So I think this case, I brought this case up because I think it highlights both a challenge as well as a possibility um, for the labor movement in the era of informality. 
The traditional unions have the ability, they have the resources to amplify the workers of informal workers, like these workers at GOTBC. But they can only do so if they're willing to do so, and if they're not beholden to the structures that are based on standard employment relations. Um, and to quote Dr. Brichum, whose research I'm, I'm drawing from, traditional trade unions can augment the power of informal workers only if they can succeed in overcoming their own internal contradictions. So that's the first case. Second case, different, completely different. Um, focuses on the organizing structures of self-employed women who work primarily as porters in the markets of Accra and other cities in the South. So the picture on the bottom, the large image, shows you sort of a typical um, market in Accra. And what you see is how crowded and how dense it is, right? So the movement of goods around this market is impeded by the numbers of people, the fact that you have traffic in between crowds and so on. Um, and so you have large numbers, speaking of sort of rural urban migration, which is really kind of my, my, what brought me to this, to this topic. Somewhere in the 1980s, women started leaving the north of the country, which is primarily agricultural, driven out by sort of the failure of agricultural livelihood, moving to the cities um, to work as market porters. Most of them don't migrate permanently, so they prefer to sort of go back and forth, cycle, um, between the city and, um, um, and their rural homes, go back during the harvest season when they can find agricultural employment and then return to, the, to their cities when, um, you know, and do this kind of work. They're typically hired by market vendors and their clients to carry goods between warehouses, between shops and transport centers, and their labor is essential to the movement of goods um, around the crowded markets. In Ghana, they are known as kayaye, which basically means women who carry loads. When I first encountered them, they lacked access to health care and housing. They had to pay a daily flat rate to municipal authorities. And they seemed to fit the stereotype of unorganizable workers. They were floating population. They didn't stay long enough in the city to organize. They work in a highly individualized setting. They're competing with each other for clients. They lack bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis their clients and so on, right? So I recently came across this image on Instagram. This is a picture from 2020. This is an, the market porters um, demonstrating outside the offices of the old Fadama Kayaye Youth Association, an organization that they belong to, following the announcement of the citywide lockdown in 2020. The lockdown had made it impossible for them to earn a living. The government had promised access to food and water. This had not materialized. And so they were asking for all those things, as well as um, support for a two-week quarantine while they returned home. And above all, they were there to assert their humanity. Nowadays, it's much, it's common to see newspapers talking about protests um, featuring these women. So how did they find their voice? I think there's a couple of uh, sort of very prim preliminary research suggests that there are several factors that can help us to answer this question. One is the role of WIGO in facilitating policy dialogues that resulted in several wins for the porters. So the first of these policy dialogues was focused on health. It took place in 2012. It brought together representatives from the Ghana National Health Insurance Authority, the Ministry of Health, as well as organizations representing the porters. Um, prior to this policy dialogue, research, WIGO's own research had shown that there were several features of the National Health Insurance Scheme that limited their access to health care. Um, and the policy dialogue resulted in several positive outcomes. One was that the, the women, the porters associations, were able to negotiate a significant reduction in the annual premium for the National Health Insurance Program from $20 to $2.50 for their members. Um, and in, in general, actually other people outside of the associations also benefited. Um, and the Ministry of Health agreed to continue discussions with their associations about improving access um, and you know, improving the quality of their service. The second successful organizing effort was um, focused on the daily tax that the porters were paying to the Accra Metropolitan Authority. Um, so in 2016, right before the country's national elections, the associations of porters to working together with WIGO again 
um, developed a, pl a platform to present to the candidates who were running for election, for the national elections. And one item on the was platform was the removal of the daily taxes that they were paying. Their concern was that they were paying these taxes. But the Metropolitan Authority in the city continued to harass them for operating on the sidewalks. Um, they were successful. The, the party that won the election adopted this into their manifesto, and when they, when they won the election, announced the repeal of the tax. Now, I think this kind of success is important in generating the energy that is um, necessary to sustain any organizing efforts. The ability to work with WeGo and draw on their resources was no doubt key as well. But I think that another important factor is the existence of membership organizations. Now, the membership organizations to which people in the informal economy belong typically do not start out with the intention of, of engaging in collective action to support workers' rights to decent work and living conditions. Their focus is normally on mutual aid, self-help, ed education, and so on. But as we see, these kinds of organizations can provide opportunity for members to begin to develop a common identity, to begin to develop a shared sense of grievance, and eventually increase their collective and their representative voice. Um, so for example, the, the Youth Association didn't start out as a labor movement. It was a rotating savings and credit association for women who were living in an informal settlement, the old Fadama area in Accra. But because it was a membership organization, it provided a place for women to begin to organize, initially by drawing on the resources that WeGo provided, but eventually building on the wins from those initial efforts to develop the confidence to take on their own struggles. Um, but there's still, I think, relatively little research on these organizations, even though according to the WeGo database, there are at least 320 such organizations across Africa. It'd be good to know how and why do they emerge, how do they become viable and effective advocates for labor, what role can they play in amplifying the voices of workers in the informal economy, and what opportunities do they have to represent their members in policy making, rule setting, collective bargaining, and negotiating processes. So just to wrap up, I think that these two cases highlight both possibilities as well as the challenges of organizing informal workers. I think both cases suggest that informal workers do find, can and do find ways to increase their collective and representative voice, um, both by participating in organizations um, and align, align, forming alliances with unions, with transnational networks, all of these can play a role. But I think most importantly, they show us that although the informalization of employment and the rise of precarity poses challenges to the labor movement in Ghana and beyond. These challenges are not insurmountable. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, two terrific presentations. Jess, please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to start today uh, by talking just briefly, introducing myself and recognizing that I'm not a worker. I'm not a worker organization. I'm not a worker's rep, and I'm certainly not a part of a union. And so you may have gotten a little shortchanged in terms of who's going to be here to talk about organizing fishers. On top of that, I am an academic researcher, but I'm actually not an economist. Uh, my background is actually in social work, uh, both my research training and prior to being a researcher, I was a clinical social worker on the ground uh, for almost a decade doing crisis response. But uh, my, that has very much informed my ethos about research and making sure that fishers are at the center of all research that we produce. Fishers may be one of the most invisible work populations in the entire world because they work at sea where unless you happen to be on a luxury yacht sailing past their vessel, you're probably never actually going to see them. So my research focuses a lot on using co-production methods. And one of the reasons is because I think it's pretty grossly inappropriate as a white woman in a high-income country uh, to be talking about these populations. Instead, I see my role as making space for their voices to be heard in the room, a space that often doesn't exist because uh, one of the most unique dimensions about fishing is that a port is a border. 
So often fishers cannot actually leave a port to even step foot into a country. If you're unaware, in the United States, in the Tuna Longline Fleet in Honolulu, Hawaii, we employ primarily Filipino, uh, Vietnamese, and Indonesian fishers. They're on two to three year contracts, often making three to 350 US dollars a year. And they have no immigration status in this country because of a loophole. They're picked up in Mexico, brought or American Samoa, brought to Hawaii, and they don't leave the port. They live and work on those vessels for two to three years. The fact that a port is a border is very instrumental in understanding the systemic uh, challenges and opportunity or systemic problems that perpetuate these issues. So I also want to recognize uh, that as, especially as researchers, we do a, an egregious job of invisibilizing fishers even more. We tend to rely on proxy data. There's a new obsession, in my opinion, with satellite data from vessels. Satellites don't see discrimination. Satellites don't see wage theft. And while I think there is a role for those new types of data to reinforce what they're doing, we shouldn't use them as an excuse to exclude workers from the conversation. So most of what I'm gonna talk about today is informed by two projects, one of which is ongoing, in which we have um, managed to collect over 4,000 surveys from fishers all over the world. Those 4,000 plus surveys represent workers working on vessels flagged to more than 100 countries in the world, visiting more than 400 ports in more than 100 countries, and those crew represent more than 90 nationalities on board those vessels. Just prior to that research, uh, we did the first ever baseline study of working conditions in the UK fisheries, and uh, high-income countries are uh, not exempt from these issues, as I think we all know um, in this room. And I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, two of my most important collaborators, uh, who are the International Transport Workers Federation, which is a confederation of unions uh, whose affiliates have the remit in fisheries, and Stella Morris, which is part of the Catholic Church, who has chaplains and volunteers based in more than 63 countries in the world. These are the folks who are on the ground every day doing the casework, retrieving wages, and putting their bodies um, in harm's way to help these fishers. And they happen to be uh, my two biggest research collaborators. So globally, the fishing industry has one of the lowest unionization rates in the world. Uh, we estimate that probably less than 1% of fishers globally are unionized, and most of those are actually from Argentina and from Scandinavian countries. And so how that unionization contributes to the problem, uh, the ILO estimates that 128,000 fishers globally are working in conditions of forced labor, they also acknowledge that this is likely an egregious underestimate. But it's also important to recognize that there's a spectrum of working conditions. Uh, recently in fishing, we're really perseverating on the extreme end, the forced labor, modern slavery, et cetera. Uh, in my opinion, that's the minimum starting point, is eliminating that. And we really need to also be focused on, besides eliminating that, focused on everything that doesn't reach that threshold. In particular, uh, various facets of labor exploitation, which are really rampant in the industry. And what is a little bit unique about fishing is that we actually have an international convention that defines standards and norms for decent work in fishing. Part of this is, is fishing's really unique. I think Professor Mason the other day was talking about international trade flows and, and you can't talk about these problems without talking about globalization. So as an example of why um, we have these standards at the international level, uh, I have a case from this week that we've been working on. And if you'd like to count the countries with me, it is a Spanish owned vessel. It is flagged to the United Kingdom, that is legal. The crew, we know that some countries regulate uh, recruitment, uh, sending countries. The 16 crew are from Indonesia, Ghana, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, and India. The Sri Lankan and Indian crew used an online recruiter from Bulgaria. The vessel fishes west of Ireland, which is international waters. It goes into port, into Castletown Barra in the Republic of Ireland for fuel, doesn't land its fish there. Instead, it goes to Cape Verde, where it lands its fish. If you were counting, that is 10 countries plus international waters, all with complex and differing regulatory frameworks. Um, and those frameworks can contradict one another. They may cover individual facets, but not the entire problem. 
well, so recognized, and I think the ILO mostly agrees with me, the Work and Fishing Convention is very much a starting point and not the end point. The other reason why I think it's really important to talk about this spectrum of working conditions, uh, in those 4,000 plus surveys that we have, about 11% of them probably meet the criteria for forced labor, human trafficking, and modern slavery. That's still a really large number, but 67% are in violation of some type of labor rights, be that the flag states laws, um, perhaps the, uh, the country, a port state measure, et cetera. Uh, this is a very tedious piece of work where all those countries that are involved were trying to map the regulatory frameworks onto the working conditions that these fishers have reported. And most importantly, if we are talking about improving working conditions, every fisher should be working in conditions of decent work. And even if we use the ILO convention, which has its issues, uh, we still get only about 3% of fishers surveyed working in conditions of decent work. Biggest uh, issues that workers reported is wages and wages and bonuses. I think this is where fishing uh, deviates um, in an interesting way from other sectors. Yesterday we talked about if you don't work, you don't get paid. In fishing, there are lots of different remuneration schemes. Historically, fishing has been uh, uh, considered a self-employed occupation because you were paid based on a share of the catch. So it actually tends to be national or domestic fishers who get paid on a share of the catch, which they would be the type where if they don't work, they don't get paid. Um, why that's important is, for example, in the United Kingdom, and I should have specified uh, previously, uh, I previously worked in the UK for five years. I was associate director of the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham, and I only recently um, moved back to the States, where I'm now at Tufts University in Boston. But why those remuneration schemes are really important is it intersects with work and rest hours. So the example in the United Kingdom, as we can have a vessel with a Filipino fisher, a Ghanaian fisher, um, working side by side with UK nationals. There's only gonna be four to six crew on these vessels. Our vessels tend to be quite small in the UK. The national share fishers, they all have the exact same job. They're all deckhands, they do the exact same functions on board. Those national share fishers make somewhere between two and 3,000 pounds per month, and it can go as high as four to 5,000 if the fishing is good. In contrast, the Filipinos are paid 1,450 US dollars per month, and the Ghanaian crew on average make about 1,100 US dollars per month. It's not actually violating a law. There's nothing in UK law that says they all have to get paid the same. On top of that, when they're out at sea, there is an incentive to work as long and as hard as you can because those national share fishers, the more they work, the bigger the catch will be, the bigger their income is. Whereas the Ghanaians and Filipinos are on a fixed wage. So the longer they work, their per hour income is just constantly going down. In addition, the national share fishers, they get to go home and they go rest when they get into port. The migrant fishers, um, they have no immigration entitlement. They're mostly employed on transit visas, which means that they sleep and live on the boat and they immediately go back out. So we have, uh, in the UK, they often employ two captains. So the captain may go home, the new captain comes, in six or seven hours, the migrant fishers are back on the boat and they have new national crew with them. Uh, the other issue is that that ILO convention, with the U which the UK has ratified, and which the ILO, ILO holds up the UK as the gold standard, which I really wish they would stop doing, um, says that you are required to have 10 hours of rest in any 24-hour period and 77 hours of rest in a seven-day period. What went wrong is that in the UK, our national implementation um, says that we can average that out over the year. So migrant fishers work every single day for 10 months they get sent home for two months and then they're brought back. And because they get sent home for those two months, it on average, it, it averages out to meet the ILO minimum. However, fishing's the most dangerous occupation in the world. So if you're working on average 20 hours a day, which is what uh, the migrant fishers in our study reported, you are um, exacerbating the safety risks that occur on board a vessel. Other factors frequently discussed by workers but often not considered by stakeholders, and this is going to the more global context, is food and water is managed and provisioned for them. It is racialized and it can be used as a source of control and it can be used to divide different nationalities on board a vessel. Very helpfully, in the ILO convention, there's a mandate that says as the vessel owner employer, you're required to 
provide, quote, a sufficient quantity and quality of nutritious food and water. If anyone knows what that actually looks like or how that should be operationalized, I'd love to talk to you. That is all it says. So there's no way to effectively enforce that. And on top of it, it's highly racialized um, and is actually used in discrimination of various nationalities. Community can be a double-edged sword. We know because they're very isolated out at sea, they build great community amongst each other. But uh, in the UK, we've heard lots of accounts of vessel owners showing them videos of uh, countrymen being beaten. And that's used as a source of control. So it can be a threat without ever actually inflicting physical violence. Uh, they're incentivized to report grievances because uh, you have migrant fishers working on vessels which are going to ports all over the world. They rarely have an immigration status to get off the vessel. Um, and if they report something, basically their options are to go home, so they'll lose out on wages that they were promised in their contract, or they can put their head down and keep working. Um, mental health is not discussed nearly enough. Most dangerous occupation in the world. Estimated 100,000 people die in fishing each year. Even without exploitive conditions, uh, they are witnessing very traumatic things, and mental health provisions are very much lacking. Um, harm from voluntary corporate social responsibility initiatives has been a frequent topic lately, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And there's an absence of remedy. Um, we've talked briefly uh, today at various points about trade bans, which are certainly useful in motivating companies and governments to change, but that change takes a while. And we've heard workers talk about how trade bans aren't actually delivering any remedy to them directly. And part of this is because of this immigration precarity. So if the vessel stops fishing, they may or may not be getting paid. They may or may not have a way to recoup their wages if they stop getting paid. Because if you're an Indonesian on a Taiwanese flag vessel in the Port Stanley in the Falklands slash Malvinas Islands, how exactly are you going to get your wages? Who are you going to ask for those wages? I just want to flag also, if you look in the academic literature, if you read media reports, you would think these are the only two geographies in the world where we have labor abuses on board vessels, which would be Southeast Asia and the West Coast of Africa. In our research over the past 10 years, um, every country in blue is a flag state country where we have identified at least labor exploitation in violation of legal rights and entitlements, if not forced labor. And if you're in gray, doesn't necessarily mean you're absolved, just means that we don't have any data yet. And I want to talk briefly about the theft of fishers' power by the supply chain. Uh, fishing is a unique industry where because it's a shared resource and you don't have any control over the inputs, um, the environmental NGOs were very active in the space very early on. And so we have a unique um, situation in fishing where a lot of the supply chain initiatives, not only are they voluntary, but they're being led by environmental NGOs. And this has actually caused um, quite a bit of harm to workers. So taking up finite space and resources, false illusion of progress, um, we know there's been lots of fair washing. Uh, there have been MSC certified fisheries and fishery improvement projects that have been trade bans implemented for forced labor. Um, we, they're relying on transparency, which is not assurance because they don't talk to workers. Um, and they're conflating lack of use of grievance mechanisms if they exist with no problems. Also, we have a big issue with retailers that are hyper-focusing only on the elimination of forced labor. Um, and they're using benchmarks like number of arrests and convictions. Um, I only know of five convictions for forced labor in the global fishing industry. There could be more, but uh, I've been working in this space for over 10 years, and I'm aware of five. So if that's a precondition to have a, a sustainability certification, I'm not really sure what in the world it's measuring. Uh, and workers, other perceptions of harm, it's ignoring what they want. The biggest thing they want is increased equitable and reliable wages, improved access to medical care, which is also tied to not having an immigration status, and that reduced immigration precarity. Uh, these initiatives are also trying to build these very large at scale grievance mechanisms, uh, which fishers aren't going to use, um, and they're at risk of displacing trusted communication channels um, that make reporting less onerous and risky for them. And these things overlook structural drivers. I liked what Professor Mason said yesterday about the words that are missing in the economics field. Well, the words that are missing in these voluntary initiatives are things like privilege, systemic oppression, power. You don't see those words in these initiatives. So some barriers to organizing. 
Uh, the globalized industry that we've talked about, uh, that gets very complicated with all the different uh, states, regulations, uh, all the different nationalities on board. Um, I'm increasingly worried, unclear if it's a COVID effect, um, but we increasingly have, you know, eight, nine, ten nationalities on board one vessel, and we suspect that that's being used to um, reduce the risk of solidarity building. Um, uh, they're all different languages. They struggle to communicate with one another, and there can be long-standing cultural tensions between them. Um, hostile environments, Thailand, it's illegal for them to unionize. In the UK, our immigration law is called the hostile environment. Literally, they're being very transparent about what they're trying to achieve there. Um, and it leads to diffuse discrimination and, uh, like I said, can preclude solidarity. Um, and there's an absence of shared risk, like we talked about with the remuneration, et cetera. And so the question is, what role should unions play in organizing workers if it is one of the least unionized professions um, out there? So uh, there is things like the Fisher Rights Network. Uh, it looks, smells, and acts like a union, but it operates not a union because it's operating in Thailand. Um, we are pursuing a WSR pilot in UK fishing, and that's with the, the CIW, uh, the Fair Food Standards Council, the coal, or the um, focus on labor exploitation flex, which is a local NGO in the UK, and with the union, the International Transport Workers Federation. Um, one of our challenges is what comes first, development of remedy and remediation pathways or organizing. It's a little bit like the chicken and the egg. Organizing has been very difficult in lots of different contexts because there's a, a perception that there's absolutely no remedy and remediation, that your only uh, real solution is to go home and not get the rest of your wages on your contracts. Uh, we are working towards building a global fund that retailers put money into that can at least be used to pay uh, remaining wages, et cetera. And how to balance nationality tensions within a union. I think that's been touched upon as well. Um, for example, in Ireland, there's also a Fisher's Rights Network um, because uh, the local unions have said that they don't want to unionize migrants um, because there have been some high profile incidents where employers have basically sacked all uh, local workers to bring in migrant uh, laborers who were paid a lot less. We have the same situation in the UK, so the unions are also reticent um, to organize. Uh, there's thoughts about organizing uh, in sending countries. Uh, there's been, you know, there's some concerns about who unions represent, corruption, et cetera. Um, so it is a difficult and complex um, context, but lots of people are working um, to see how we can organize such a mobile population. And if you give me 20 seconds, I just want to end on um, victories. I think we so often focus on deficit-centered research, and we don't recognize um, the brilliance of the resistance that the workers are doing themselves. So a couple of victories we've had in global fishing uh, over the summer with the largest withdrawal of labor in fishing ever with coordinated strikes across Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, and Seychelles. And these were all on Spanish-owned vessels. The Spanish are very naughty. Um, don't listen to what the media says. Um, in Ireland, uh, the ITF uh, recouped almost 100,000 euros in wages in the past 24 months through the Workplace Relations Commission. Um, and that's through that informal Fisher Rights Network. And in the UK, it's a little bit of a low bar, but we finally got inspectors to learn to interview crew away from the vessel owner and captain. And that is codified in their guidance. That was a big win, folks. Uh, so celebrate the victories of the fishers. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. So now we have Liana. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you and part of this rich discussion. My name is Liana Foxvogue, and I'm the Director of Supply Chain Strategies at the Worker Rights Consortium. And the WRC is an independent nonprofit monitoring organization with 146 university affiliates, including UMass Amherst. I'm also a lecturer in labor studies here on campus. And the first part of my presentation will look at how the structure of the global garment industry drives violations of workers' basic rights and how that necessitated the creation of university codes of conduct and the formation of the WRC to work to achieve remedy for those violations. 
The second part will look at worker-driven social responsibility as, the necessar as a, a necessary solution in the apparel industry. Globally, about 35 million people work in the garment industry, and around 70% are women. By the early 90s, brands had moved most apparel production overseas to reduce costs. The brands and retailers in most cases no longer owned factories. They contract to avoid financial liabilities. They contracted with factory owners from around the world, giving them flexibility to shift production from one factory to the next and from one country to another. As consumers became more aware of this, advocates exposed the abusive conditions in the factories where apparel was produced, particularly in Southeast Asia and Central America. These abuses shocked the public. TV and newspapers highlighted disturbing reports of workers earning pennies per hour, being subjected to forced pregnancy tests, humiliation, and physical abuse. At this point in the 1990s, US brands denied any responsibility for workers that they did not directly employ, saying workers' safety and welfare was the responsibility solely of the factory owners. This graphic shows the complexity of the system. Brands sourced from factories around the world, ranging from small employers to multinational firms operating factories in a number of countries. Brands may place orders directly or through agents or brokers. In addition to the outsourced production, other key dynamics of of global garment production are short-term contracts to factories an order at a time without any long-term commitments. Brands spread their orders out to avoid concentrating too much production volume in any one factory, meaning that each factory has numerous customers. It's a buyer's market. Excess manufacturing capacity means intense competition among suppliers. For factories, survival means offering lower prices than the competition and agreeing to contract terms that overwhelmingly favor the buyers. In this consumer price index graph, the lower line in blue shows how in the past 40 years, the retail price of clothing has not kept pace at all with the price of other consumer goods in the United States, with the gap only continuing to widen. This enormous pressure on factories to decrease prices drives a tendency among many factories to violate workers' rights as they compete for brands' business. The way this often works is that there's a lack of enforcement around labor laws and health and safety law. This is sometimes about capacity, but it's often also due to political will. In many countries producing apparel, the garment industry has significant political power, and governments believe that foreign buyers want less regulation and lower wages, so they're very hesitant to increase the enforcement of their labor laws for fear of driving away business. The factories know they need to control their costs, and since there's a lack of enforcement of the law, they resort to illegal means to do it. They can't squeeze much out of the cost of cloth, energy, and transport, since those are pretty fixed. So they try to find ways to squeeze on labor. They violate wage laws. They push out workers who are pressing for better treatment or trying to form unions. They cut corners on safety. And all of these are efforts to cut down costs and keep things cheap. And as a result, many employers in the sector are paying poverty wages, workers are working in poor conditions, required to meet extremely high production quotas, and many factories are quite dangerous. The brands do have their own codes of conduct, which say their suppliers must meet the laws of the country of production, as well as international labor standards, and they develop corporate social responsibility programs around those codes of conduct. But none of these are binding commitments. There's no obligation on brands to pay a price that makes compliance possible and no obligation to quit suppliers that abuse workers. These programs lack transparency and don't involve any role for workers in monitoring and oversight. It's essentially corporate self-regulation. Under pressure to improve, companies have worked with governments and some civil society groups to create multi-stakeholder initiatives. Here's a visual from MSI Integrity's report, Not Fit for Purpose. The report was the culmination of a project started at the International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School that asked, are MSIs effective at protecting human rights? After 10 years of research, they concluded, and I quote, this grand experiment has failed in its goal of providing effective protection against abuse, 
They are not fit for purpose to de reliably detect abuses, hold corporations to account for harm, or provide access to remedy. And I'll highlight four of their key insights. On stakeholder participation, MSIs entrench corporate power by failing to include rights holders and by preventing civil society from acting as an agent of change. On monitoring and compliance, MSIs employ inadequate methods to detect human rights abuses and uphold standards. On remedy, MSIs are not designed to provide rights holders with access to effective remedy. On impact, there is little evidence, and this is including from the MSIs themselves, that MSIs are meaningfully protecting rights holders or closing governance gaps. Overall, they say, after their 10-year research project, MSIs have not fundamentally restricted corporate power or addressed the power imbalances that drive abuse. So where are their levers for change? Well, for one example, collegiate apparel is a $4 billion market. Universities sign multi-year licensing agreements and sponsorship agreements with major apparel brands. For example, here at UMass, you'll see the Adidas logo featured prominently around the sports facilities. As you can see in this article, the issue of collegiate apparel made in sweatshop conditions gained prominent attention in the late 90s. Students organized and rallied for change. In response to the call from students appalled at labor rights abuses, many schools took three steps that were each unprecedented in the industry. They adopted binding codes committed to transparency and signed on to independent worker-centered monitoring. By embedding codes of conduct in contracts with licensees and through their work enforcing these codes over the past two decades, universities have raised the bar in the industry. These codes were the first time that contractual obligations to protect workers were introduced in the garment sector. With university codes, if a violation is identified, licensees have to correct it, not just when it's convenient, not based on their own definition of compliance, but for the first time based on an external objective standard. Before universities required that licensees disclose their supplier factories in the year 2000, not a single factory was disclosed by apparel brands. Licensees initially resisted universities' proposals that they disclose their factories. They claimed this was confidential information and that sharing it would harm their business and undermine the industry. Universities, however, stood strong and required that all licensees disclose factory names and locations. This led to change in transparency in the industry, throughout the industry. Adidas and Nike began disclosing all their factories, not just those the schools required. They went from seeing disclosure as a threat to promoting it as a benchmark for responsible business leadership. After the WRC and other organizations worked together on a transparency pledge, more than 100 brands now disclose their cut and sew fact suppliers similar to this Nike example here. These disclosures are compiled on Open Supply Hub. As an example, here's a snapshot of Columbia Sportswears. The apparel industry is now exceptionally transparent in terms of factory names and locations, well beyond any other sector. The third element introduced by the universities was the creation of the WRC as a truly independent monitor. The WRC is accountable to three constituencies, which have equal votes on our governing board, representatives of affiliate schools, students, and an advisory council representing experts and practitioners in the field. These three innovations by universities created the basis for work done by the WRC over the past two decades. First, universities require full disclosure of all factory names and locations through licensing firms. This information is shared with us and made public through our online database. Our team is constantly in touch with workers and rights organizations in key countries. When we receive a complaint, we can cross-check it with the disclosure data to confirm whether licensed apparel is produced in the factory and for which licensees. Then we conduct our investigation, interviewing workers off-site, without knowledge of management, reviewing documents, and depending on the nature of violations being investigated, conduct a site investigation. To do this, we make connections with local organizations that have relationships of trust with workers. When we are ready to contact factory management to hear their side of the story, licensees often assist us in obtaining their cooperation. 
Our reports are public, providing a detailed account of our findings, the evidence on which they're based, and the response of the relevant parties. Where possible, we ascertain whether the brands will ensure remediation before publishing. The combination of enforceable standards, universities standing by those standards, and the WRC pressing for necessary remedies, even when brands are resistant, has led to transformative impacts. In Honduras, the 2009 agreement between Russell and the CGT Union has transformed the labor rights environment in the Honduran garment industry, leading to change um, at, also at other factories. For example, in the past two years, similarly, it's becoming expected also beyond the collegiate sphere that when workers are owed money, they have to get it. For example, in the past two years, we've won more than $10 million for workers who were left penniless when their factories closed. So I will skip this part comparing CSR to WSR because many people have spoken about it brilliantly already. And before I talk about the landmark WSR program in the sector, some very brief background on why it's needed. And um, we have to ask how it's possible in the entire history of the industry how the worst three disasters happened in 2012 and 2013. A century earlier, the oops. Okay. A century earlier, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City killed 146 people, mostly young women and girls. Since then, it has been widely known what it takes to keep workers safe in a multi-story building. But as Bangladesh grew to become the second largest exporter of apparel globally, there were a series of horrific fires and other, other devastating safety incidents across dozens of factories. This slide shows the five worst disasters from 2010 to 2013, four in Bangladesh and one in Pakistan. Every single one of these factories with mass fatalities had been audited multiple times by leading apparel brands but those auditors were never asked to look for hazards that were killing workers. Nowhere else was it so clear that brands' own auditing systems were utterly failing to protect workers, and this demonstrated the vital need for a new approach to workplace safety. After the fire at That's It Sports, where in December 2010, the concept was created for a binding agreement to make factories safer and help prevent more death in the industry. But brands dragged their feet and more workers continued to die in preventable disasters. Even after the Tazreen Fashions fire killed 112 workers trapped inside, no new companies joined the two, early, two companies that were the early signers. After Rana Plaza collapsed on April 24, 2013, killing 1,134 workers who had been forced to work that day, even when they could see the cracks in the building, brands could no longer ignore the calls to action from dozens of students, or sorry, from students, activists, investors, and governments around the world and dozens of brands swiftly signed on. The Accord was founded in May 2013 as a binding agreement between global union federations and Bangladeshi unions on the one hand, and apparel brands and retailers on the other. The WRC is one of the four NGO signatories to the Accord. Ultimately, more than 200 companies joined in, enabling the Accord to cover over 1,600 factories in Bangladesh that employ 2.5 million workers. The accord worked when the industry-led schemes did not because it was legally binding, it required brands to pay fair prices, and it obligated brands to not do business with factories that refused to comply. I know we're very close to time. I'll need to take another bit. Um, these are some of the major US brands that are in the accord. And a powerful illustration of just how weak the inspections were before the accord is that when its engineers entered most of these factories, it was the first time that a competent safety engineer had set foot inside the building. Indeed, every single factory they inspected was in violation of fire and building safety code. And here you can see the difference in the electrical cabling before and after the accord. It's important to note prior to the accord, practically, practically no export garment factory in Bangladesh had a functioning fire exit. Indeed, the Accord's engineers found that across the 1,600 factories, there were virtually zero fire exits, as we had as suspected. Most factories had collapsible metal gates of the type shown on the left, which don't do anything to prevent rising smoke from engulfing an entire floor. Even worse, many of these gates were typically locked, causing workers to be trapped inside during fires. 
A crucial result of the Accord's inspections is that locks were immediately removed and doors have been replaced with fireproof doors that swing out so that workers won't be trapped. Here's the remains of a factory after a recent fire. The fire-rated doors had already been installed under the Accord's requirements, and as a result, workers were able to escape through the stairwells that are still left standing, and no one died or was injured. So we have some stats here, which I will not go through, but 92% um, of the safety hazards have been remediated. More than 500 factories have had all safety hazards um, uh, fully remediated. And the Accord also includes a worker complaint mechanism. Its trainings have reached nearly 2 million workers. Um, and of course, it's not just in Bangladesh, it's in other countries, which is why the Accord is working to expand. Um, Pakistan is one of the major countries, and it's now been expanding to Pakistan, and there's 80 brands that have signed on to the expansion to Pakistan. So I'll end there. That was an absolutely fascinating session. I'm really sorry for rushing all of you, but because it was so interesting, so insightful, I know there are going to be lots of questions, so we have to give some time for the discussion, so thanks. Okay, uh, we're going to take two from the live audience and then one online and go in that order, yes? So maybe we take a few questions first and then get people to answer. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question for Seema Kukarni. I'm Mary Ellen Cohane from MCLA. Um, I'm wondering, as women are turning to producing more food instead of just cotton and other things, um, are they having access to, to bio um, enhancements to the soil? And uh, what are mechanisms for, for helping with that? Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Auditra, PhD student in this department. The question is for Seema. I'm interested in, I look at uh, interactions of uh, uh, reproduction and uh, how policies are made around it in uh, historical context, contexts. Uh, you mentioned hysterectomies and you mentioned wombless villages. Would you talk a bit more about what specifically is happening around that? Thank you. There's an online uh, question. We'll add that if you don't mind. Or do you want to yeah. yeah. Sugar keeps appearing as a culprit wreaking violence on land, water, women. Question, just as you're working for alternative agriculture, is there a need to make sugar less profitable? OK, I think. Uh, Bunch of questions for Seema. Can I very cheat, abuse my position, and quickly ask a question to all of you, actually? I think all of you highlighted something very interesting, which is the divisions between workers and how those could be overcome. So it would be interesting to get some experience about how and under what conditions you have been able to overcome these differences, whether they're national or male, female, or you know, all of these divisions. So uh, uh, thank you for those questions, because I was not really able to uh, say much about that. But uh, your question about uh, bio inputs, and uh, that is really a very uh, major constraint uh, to make that transition to natural farming. Uh, what we are doing right now is, of course, uh, supporting women farmers through uh, bio resource inputs, so farmyard manure. Uh, for a period of two to three years. So that's uh, the whole idea about the mixed farming model is that your initial first or up to two years is when you would need that external bioresource input. But the kind of farming model that we are talking about will actually allow for production of that compost or the bioresource input uh, so the farm itself will be able to produce that. But the more important question really is 
uh, what is the government doing? Because government is supporting chemical fertilizer lobbies, pesticide lobbies, and that is where we are saying that you know there is a need to support uh, bio resource inputs. Some of the states in the country, like a southern state, uh, Andhra Pradesh, where the government has taken the lead and is actually supporting uh, farmers, small and marginal farmers, with uh, very interesting initiatives around uh, helping that transition uh, po make possible. But uh, here, I think it is for the government to really take this upon itself, to bring up policies that will really uh, say, you know, make a very strong statement against the entire chemical uh, lobby. But currently, uh, it is our group which is supporting uh, these women to make that transition uh, through direct supports. It's not just about the farmyard manure, but also the lost varieties of seed. Because what we have is genetically modified seed in cotton, or the hybrid and hiding varieties of seed. So it's really also about how we encourage local production of seed, which is, you know, improved varieties, but also uh, traditional uh, varieties of seed. So that is something that uh, currently we are doing, but expect the government to really uh, take this on. Uh, the second question is about uh, wombless villages. And uh, <clears throat> this is really about the way work in uh, sugar, sugar cane uh, organized. You know, it's the it's not really the farmer who employs the sugarcane workers. So it is the sugar factory that actually employs uh, the sugarcane harvesters. So it is through the intermediaries of contractors and subcontractors. Uh, and for the sugar industry, uh, profits are very, very uh, significant. And the timeliness of actually getting the harvested sugarcane into the sugar factories for crushing is extremely critical for what they call as the recovery rate. So, you know, what is the amount of sugar that is produced from the crushed sugarcane? So what that actually means is that your workers cannot afford a single day of, you know, leave or a single day which is off from work which is also the reason why we've seen a lot of reproductive and menstrual health issues among women. Because these are, you know, early marriages, 13, 14 year olds getting married, even today, I'm not talking about few generations back. So, you know, their heavy loading starts, their sexual activity starts at really very young ages uh, with a lot of gynecological morbidity that also sets in. But there is a clear profit uh, motive here and a very strong nexus between both the sugar industry and the medical industry. So hysterectomies come with not only the fact that women find it difficult to manage menstrual health, but also with a very strong push for not missing a single day of work and therefore encouraging hysterectomies. So there is a medical industry that is also profiteering here. So, you know, the entire sort of uh, um, the profit that is driven by sugar industries on the one hand, but also the medical uh, industry on the other. So uh, uh, I think those were the two questions. Uh, Sugar is the problem, yeah. <laughs> yes. And as I said, you know, the entire economy in the country, but more specifically in the state of Maharashtra, which started out as cooperative, you know, sugar was a cooperative industry. So farmers were encouraged to grow sugarcane, but sugarcane was also encouraged because it's a long-term crop. So there is little nurture and care that is involved. So you know, you have small duration crops, short duration crops which need care and nurture. But sugarcane is clearly, you know, you grow it for 11 months, you infest it with uh, chemical fertilizers and weedicides, and you only go back to harvest at the end of 11 months. But this is also one of the crops that actually has a legal guarantee of price. So every other crop, the government talks about a policy for minimum support price, but it is only sugarcane that actually has a guaranteed price. So you can clearly see that why farmers don't 
uh, it becomes the preferred crop. Uh, there is no exit from sugarcane because you're caught in the debt cycle. So for us, really, when we are organizing sugarcane workers, it is not about pitting the farmers against the workers, but clearly calling out to the sugar factories, saying that you, know, you should be recognized as the principal employer, and ensuring, of course, remunerative pricing for growers, but also ensuring uh, rights for workers, the harvesters, but also telling the government that in a drought-prone state like uh, Maharashtra, sugarcane should not be encouraged as a crop because it's a water guzzler, it's a very water-intensive crop. So where there is no water for domestic requirements, you are talking about sugarcane just because there are profits there. And now, Government of India has an ethanol policy, and sugarcane is the main crop for ethanol production. So we are talking about ethanol blending reaching at something like 20% by 2030. And sugarcane is the crop that will be really encouraged. So we are drilling deeper and deeper into our ground, you know, trying to get water for sugarcane, but no water to drink, really. So no public investments in uh, looking at alternative crops, in looking at alternative ways of doing agriculture, really. So sugarcane, unfortunately, uh, even for small and marginal farmers, it is really the uh, crop of choice, but unfortunately. Thank you. So um, your question was about how to sort of bridge or divisions among workers. Sure, yeah. Um, so I think that's a real, that's always a challenge, right, is how to overcome those kinds of divisions. And I think a big part of it is really, I'm going to answer the question in, in generalities before I come to specifics. But I think the issue is really about educating, uh, helping or working with workers to figure out whether the problem, where the structure, the structures that are causing the problem, if that, if that makes sense. So in, for example, in the case of the formal workers and the informal workers, I mean, both of them were confronting the same source of the problem, which was this, um, this firm, which didn't want to pay the workers fairly and so on. A, a better strategy, I think, would have been for the, the two unions to work together to think about how both groups of workers could have benefited from collaborating with each other instead of fighting against each other. I, you know, so that's, um, yeah. Thanks. Um, I think for us, when we're talking about different nationalities on board a vessel, it's going to sound very simple, but shared food and shared joy. So uh, I've been on the quayside uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And the one thing I always do is bring fresh fruit, because most migrant fishers are from countries where their diet is very high in fresh produce. And when you're out on a boat for nine months, two years at a time, your access to fresh produce is very minimal. Um, also, we know that one of the the ways that racial divisions are sown on the vessel is around food and the smells of food, how food is consumed, etc. Um, so if you, a lot of fishers report feeling greater solidarity with their colleagues when they can cook for each other on board and their food is not stigmatized. And shared joy, uh, everyone loves a good karaoke. Um, <laughs> it, it's a true thing. Everyone loves a good karaoke in the fishing industry. And, uh, you know, a lot of your big distant water fleets, uh, uh, the crews are predominantly Indonesian and Filipino, both quite religious, very different religions. We're talking about predominantly Catholics and predominantly Muslims. Um, sharing each other's religion um, has been a really effective way uh, to build community around them as well. And then, you know, how do you bridge uh, migrant workers with national or domestic workers? Um, I think is a big challenge as well, but uh, you know, uh, especially in the UK, migrant workers are a cost-saving strategy. Let's just call it what it is. We know that the fixed wage system uh, drastically saves on crew costs compared to paying a share of the catch. Um, and there are plenty of folks who still hold on to fishing, this image of fishing uh, as a historical legacy of their family, and they want everyone to enjoy fishing the way that they do. Uh, and it's a reminder that 
uh, if I had a dollar for every time a vessel owner told me, well, this is a lot of money for their country, or if they really want to be treated like slaves, we can send them to, to Thailand. And uh, it's, it's constant reminding and education that that's not our comparison point. Our, our reference point should be uh, the laws and regulations, uh, baseline laws and regulations that we have in place. Um, and it's taken a long time, but uh, increasingly we do see um, some acceptance of that, although of course there are plenty of employers uh, who are still happy uh, to use uh, exclusively migrant crew because they are, it is a cost saving strategy for them. They're making a big profit off of it. Yeah, uh, first of all, really great work, everybody, great presentations. It's really a pleasure to learn from all of you. So my first question is to Jess. Um, so uh, I don't know if she's online. We have uh, one of our graduate students uh, working with me on the f global, f uh, you probably know her, Caitlin Klein, or she's, she is a, hi, Caitlin, I'm gonna ask your question. Um, so, uh, Caitlin, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Caitlin, her, her main focus is on the ecological impact of industrial fishing and climate and so forth. But uh, she's also making a point with respect to uh, the workers' conditions and drawing on your work quite considerably. And it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin, but uh, I think she's making a distinction between the corporate industrial fishing structures versus craft, uh, smaller scale craft. And part of her argument for ecological reasons is to basically abolish industrial fishing. And so the question though is, and I didn't hear a distinction in your presentation, is, is there, are there better working conditions in the craft level uh, fishing industry um, and would we expect, if we were to phase out industrial fishing, do we have the means through which we can sustain better working conditions, or would we, all else equal, expect things to you know, revert to the industrial standard? My second question it basically is to everyone. Uh, so uh, a lot of what you all talked about is, you know, conditions, inform, informal conditions. Um, and a question, it, it didn't come up uh, in any of the talks as, as far as I could tell was, uh, to what extent you think creating incentives moving the informal into the formal economy uh, through public policy, um, would that actually also encourage better working conditions to bring people into the, so are, are workers in the formal economy, whatever the proportion of the formal economy, are conditions in the formal economy better? Should we expect them to continue to be better? Okay. So, uh, Thanks, uh, before you answer, would you go to just take some more because there are so many questions and I think there's another one online and I don't know if Caitlin wants to add to Bob's question. Okay, but uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Kristen Straley. I'm an organizer at Massachusetts Jobs with Justice. And my question's for Jess. Um, I'm really interested, you, you talked about Hawaii and the, you know, the multinational crews that you're working with. And I think that's so, so interesting because Hawaii's sugarcane industry brought as many people as possible, especially Chinese and Japanese workers, expecting that there would be no solidarity between those workers. And my, my background is in medieval Mediterranean history. Um, <laughs> And, and I study lingua franca uh, in the ports. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, on these ships, do you, what are the techniques for beyond food, which I know is like a super amazing way of creating solidarity among people, but linguistically, like, is there something like lingua franca happening with these ships? Or like, what does communication look like, especially in terms of safety, when you're like, this is the most dangerous industry that we have? So. Language has to be, I am imagining, some kind of component of that. So I'm really interested to hear what you found. Do you, you have a question? No. There's one online question. 
Thank you all. I have a question about apparel. Are there st stipulations in the accord that work to address the purchasing practices of big brands? I am thinking to fulfill this principle of WSR. Buyers must afford suppliers the financial incentive and capacity to comply. Also, what about subcontracting that is massive and that is massive in apparel. How can the accord also protect workers in subcontracted factories? Okay, please. Okay, um, so we do, so first of all, there's no uh, consensus definition about what is small scale versus industrial. It varies by every single country. Uh, not every country has defined it. Sometimes it's about value of landing. Sometimes it's about size of landing. Sometimes it's about size of vessel. So what I primarily focus on is um, anything that is going into the global seafood market. So it's going to be an import export product. Um, with that said, uh, our survey, we do actually have some, uh, we interviewed and surveyed some fishers who are somewhat, uh, could potentially meet a nebulous definition of small scale. Uh, in the fishing industry, there is a long held uh, set of assumptions about working conditions and the differences. So high seas are riskier than coastal waters. Uh, if you've ever been to the UK, we have no distant water fleet. Uh, those are all coastal waters, and those guys get treated like crap, uh, just to be very honest. So what we did with our data says we're trying to test some of these assumptions. Uh, it's a bit tricky in a statistical sense, because what could be considered small scale, the samples are really imbalanced. But the reality is, is that increasingly, we see a lot of risk in small scale fisheries. Uh, for example, uh, we often classify pull in line. So those are uh, folks sitting on a vessel out at sea, and they literally go like this with a, a fishing pole over and over and over. Uh, the Maldives used to be considered a, a really good fishery, uh, but the reality is, is it's uh, increasingly due to climate change has Bangladeshi migrants in it who are getting paid a, a lot less. Uh, and so again, it's what are your benchmarks? Are you just looking for something that doesn't have forced labor, or are you actually looking for decent work and defining decent work by the international standard uh, versus the absence of its antithesis, which is very common in fishing. Um, I think certainly sustainability has three dimensions, economic, environmental, and social. And you can't have a sustainable fishery without all of those. Um, I forgot what the other parts of that question were. Sorry, it was very long <laughs> about small scale and industrial. Uh, but I think we have to be very careful about those assumptions. Um, we also know that workers in some context move between them. Um, uh, you know, they might be in a small scale uh, fleet one day and an industrial fleet the other day. Um, and, and so what does that movement mean for those parameters? Um, should we eliminate industrial fishing? Uh, my answer is no. Where are those workers going to go? Um, where are you going to find them meaningful jobs? Uh, we're talking, you know, three to seven million workers, most of them low income without other livelihood opportunities. But also, there is a real risk in the industry that when we think about the environmental side of it, we tend to vilify the industrial side. It's almost like climate change. Rather than thinking about the corporations behind it, we talk about the workers on those boats. And so we've seen a lot of conflict in places like uh, Montevideo, for example, Argentina, where there can be conflict between local fishers who would consider themselves small scale and these foreign fleets with migrant workers, and uh, this perception that industrial fishing is dirty. Uh, and, and those perceptions don't help uh, the fishers on board those boats, in my opinion. Uh, the reason why I wanted to end with victories is, even as a researcher, uh, I, I need to do better to not focus on deficit-centered research. And many, many people find great joy in, in their work on fishing boats. And I think we can't overlook that. And quite honestly, uh, years ago, when I was a social worker, I worked in the Lake Victoria Basin, so freshwater fisheries. Uh, big development organizations had funneled billions of dollars into an aquaculture program. Uh, I was hired as a research assistant after the fact. They did over 2,500 surveys, found four people working in aquaculture. I was sent in to do interviews after the fact, and uh, probably one of the most transformative things. Uh, in Swahili, the guy looked at me in the eye, and it translated to, to I'm a hunter, not a farmer. Um, Aquaculture is not a meaningful livelihood. So to assume that everyone wants to or needs to move into it, is that going to help us achieve decent work if that's not meaningful, relevant work to them? And so I think it's trying to find uh, ways to balance uh, those three tensions. And then, uh, yeah, I forgot. 
Oh, the languages. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know much about languages, so I don't even know what that means, but... Uh, uh, it can be English um, because it, it can be English. I, it's derivatives. They also use apps to try and communicate with each other. Uh, again, karaoke is like a universal bond. I'd never seen anything like it till I moved in fishing. So they'll use like music, apps, various things, um, some English. Where I think the language becomes really challenging is, um, for example, in the UK, we just ratified the ILO convention about workplace violence and harassment. and. Uh, uh, vessel owners and cap sorry more captains will use the language barriers as a reason to shout and yell and scream and um, I, it, do you really need to call people terms that I probably shouldn't repeat um, if you ask the you know a lot of fishers will normalize it you know you ask them if they've ever experienced you know abusive language or anything and they'll be like no he just calls me a f er every day, but it's fine. He's just trying to get my attention while I fish. And so I, I think there's this interesting thing about the safety, right? Because if you ask a captain, it's, well, I have to make sure that everyone can understand me. Um, there is a universal safety certificate that fishers are supposed to have before they step on board a vessel. Um, so some uh, English is essentially a somewhat universal language in fishing. Um, so I, I, I think they're using English more than anything, but certainly other tools, apps are very common for them these days. Yeah. Don't know what you um, I'll take the two questions about the accord. So the first one was, does it meet the purchasing practices criteria of worker-driven social responsibility? Um, yes, it requires brands to pay prices that are sufficient to cover the price of fire and building safety. And then the second question was about unauthorized contracting or subcontracting um, under the accord. So the accord does cover all factories that are in the supply chain in the country. Um, so if unauthorized subcontracting or authorized subcontracting is identified, then the accord worker complaint mechanism does apply there and the fire and building safety inspections also apply there. So I'll, I'll take um, your question about formalizing and informalizing. Um, so first, the first couple of points. One thing is that the boundaries between formal and informal are really blurry. Um, so for example, the um, Palm Oil um, Development Corporation is very much a formal enterprise, there's no question, but its employment relations are informal. So you know, what does formalizing look like in that context? And then for the second case that I talked about, what would formalizing that look like? Um, all too often, I think, efforts to formalize have focused on taxing, on um, requirements for registration, um, various forms of regulation, which actually make it much more difficult for people who work who in this on you know who end their who depend on informal economic activities to earn a living. So I think it's a difficult question to answer simply and say yes, simply you know formalize and everything will be fine. Um, I think a bigger the, one of the things that you try to do as an activist is to try to improve the conditions under which people who are working in the informal economy are working. But the second thing I think is to really focus on expanding economic opportunities so that people don't have to depend. I mean, for example, you know, when you look at the women that I talked about, the work they're doing is backbreaking, physically, literally backbreaking. That's not the kind of work you can do for your whole working life. You know? So the goal really should be, uh, labor activism has its strengths and, you know, but there are also limits to what it can do. And so the bigger goal, I think, for labor everywhere is to push for the kinds of economic um, policies that can create better kinds of jobs overall. Um, that would sort of be what my answer to that question is. And then if you want to. Yeah. No, I think um, uh, just answering your question and uh, uh, probably just uh, contextualizing it uh, in, uh, with the sugarcane workers. Uh, and here, I think, uh, because of the way the industry is organized, uh, yes, the sugar industry is somebody we want to you know, uh, consider as our enemy. And in that sense, uh, pin them down as the employer. So, uh, so where, 
I mean, that is one of the very strong arguments that we've been making that, and, and which the sugar industry is completely avoiding because they raise their hands and call themselves a sick industry every time, you know, there are. Uh, so, so yes, to formalizing uh, to the ex extent that we want to establish a relationship of who is the employer and who are your employees, because that's very uh, significant for us in terms of actually start talking about entitlements. And also uh, what has happened uh, really very well in Tamil Nadu, where the Workers' Federation has managed to uh, bring in uh, sectoral uh, levies or cess. So for example, here, uh, some little success has been achieved in Maharashtra with the sugar industry, where uh, they are now uh, mandated to actually put in uh, a percent of uh, every ton of sugarcane that is crushed, uh, 10 rupees would be contributed by uh, the sugar factories. Now that goes towards welfare. It's a very small amount, but that is the kind of uh, relationship uh, that you know, would be meaningful in ensuring these kind of sectoral levies. But there's a complete limit to that, uh, partly because of the, uh, you know, the nature of the workers themselves. So for six months, they would be engaged in this kind of work. But for the rest of the six months, we have to talk about them as agriculture labor, working on other kinds of work, but also working on their own farms. And that is where the state becomes you know, very critical, because here is where uh, our demands will be about social and economic protection but also guaranteeing a minimum income. And that's one of the major demands of the farmers, where they are talking about remunerative pricing. So it's a legal guarantee. So I think it's a gray area with the kind of uh, workers that we are talking about in the Indian context, where you are engaged in multiple uh, activities all at the same time. So women are workers, women are cultivators, they're also migrant labor, the construction workers. So. Our demand really has been to focus on social and economic protection. Wherever uh, we have been able to establish an employer-employee relationship to talk about uh, certain sectoral levies that need to come into the, the state coffers and enter into tripartite agreements. So where the state is equally responsible for also then generating local employment, public employment, uh, uh, for for the kind of workers that we are talking about. So yeah, the answer is really not about yes and no because of the kind of workers uh, that uh, we are really talking about. I don't have answers, but we are really happy to learn from you and the time. Wow, I think we've run out of time. So, uh, but this was absolutely amazing. You know, this morning we heard about scholar activists, and I think we've just seen an extraordinary example of, of four really brilliant scholar activists. So I think they deserve another hand, right? I don't know if there are any logistic and I also want to thank the organizers for such a brilliant assembly of people, honestly. Yeah. I'll take, I'll take a lot of credit for the, oh, bringing such fabulous people here. Thank you very much. Um, so we're having the uh, reception right downstairs till 5.30, and then uh, the dinner is at the uh, Formosa, of course. So uh, yeah, that would be at, um, what, 6, 5.30? 6.30. OK, so yeah, downstairs, and then for those who are, want to come, dinner is at Formosa at 6... 6.30. 6.30. Or you can come. 62 Main Street, if, we were, if you were last night, 63 Bistro, just keep walking another block, half block, you're right there. So, see you all. Thanks for a great day. See you all tomorrow morning also at 9 o'clock.